Hey everybody, it's Aaron Califato. I'm going to break format for this episode of seven minute stories and present another guest storyteller. Dennis Kucinich. Most of you know his name, or at least it rings a bell. He's been on the national political scene for many, many, many years, but he's from Cleveland, Ohio, the same area where, my, where I'm from, where my family's from. And he was the mayor for the city of Cleveland. They called him the boy wonder. He made a big splash in controversy. And he was a former U.S. representative for the state of Ohio for many years. And he was also a candidate for the Democratic nomination for the presidency in 2004 and 2008. So he even had a bigger stage to kind of share some of his ideas and philosophies. And I wanted to give you really quick context to this segment because uh, obviously, he didn't win the presidency during uh, his efforts in 2004 and 2008, but he also, his ideas, regardless if you agree with him politically or not, he has stayed true and has been talking about certain things that are really ahead of their time. What I mean by that is in 2019, or excuse me, for the 2020 election, a lot of the uh, Democratic nominees are talking about stuff that Kucinich has been talking about for you know, 25, 30 plus years or more. So to his, I think, um, detriment as well, he stood really firm on some of these ideas um, and and really didn't advance further in his presidential efforts, I think, because of them. Uh, that being said, he's still made an impact statewide and nationally, and he's got people that know him around the world. And so in 2018, he decided he was going to run for governor for the state of Ohio. And he eventually lost in the primary to Richard Cordray. But during that time in 2018, I got a chance to interview uh, Mr. Kucinich. We sat down at the City Club of Cleveland and we had a conversation that went on for over an hour, almost an hour and a half. And it, what you're about to hear is a seven minute segment from that conversation. And I just wanted to say I found Mr. Kucinich to be incredibly thoughtful, serious, uh, virtuous and committed to his ideas. And regardless of what your thoughts are about him politically, put this stuff aside. I mean this, even for the people who like him politically, put that aside and take a second here to listen to this, this man who really opened up and was really vulnerable, talked about what it was like growing up in the inner city of Cleveland and how that shaped him. And he talked about his views and philosophies on war and the military industrial complex. And then he ends the segment with a moment that shaped and influenced the rest of his life. You know, sometimes with stories that I tell, you know, every week or when we have a guest, I always want to present it human first, right? We live in a weird world in which there's a lot of layers and a lot of judgment and a lot of headlines and a lot of very surfacey interaction where we make quick judgments about human beings who are incredibly deep and complex. Uh, I know you are, I am as well. And so I thought this segment here really illustrated, I think some depth and hopefully gives you a deeper look into the man himself, not the politics, not all the other stuff, but a person. And I hope you find it to be as compelling uh, as I did. So I'll let Dennis take it from here. And I think he starts this portion. I think I had asked him something like, what was it like growing up in Cleveland? And then he talked about, that uh, his family went through some difficult times. His dad worked, but they were very poor. And he sort of dives into that moment and then takes us from there. So enjoy it. But I always, I was always fortunate. I had, uh, whether it was, uh, you know, teachers or coaches or, or they're all, anytime it seemed like I was going to fall through the cracks. Someone was there? Someone was there. I mean, I, I, my, my life has been so blessed because, and I realize how important it is for children to have not just early childhood education, but yeah. to have people who will be there for them. You know, sometimes it's relatives, sometimes the teacher. So yeah, I mean, I've, I've um, you know, in moments when it seemed like all was lost, there was always somebody there to, uh, to say, come on, you're gonna be okay. P politically now and not jumping but politically this is kind of a larger question you talk about like connectivity you've mm -hmm. been there you've seen the good and the bad you grew up in a in a situation where 
when you get on a platform and you talk about social justice mm-hmm. or you talk about economic justice, you have a reference point? Well, my reference point is, you know, we, we grew up, and you know, I grew up in an inner city family, the oldest at seven. My parents never owned a home. And because we had trouble finding rent, you know, as a family grew, huh. this back in the 50s, they'd have, there'd be ads in the newspapers which would say, no children or two children only. We couldn't find a place. At that point, we had maybe four children, Yeah, five children. So there was a place we moved into off of Huff Avenue that we were able to get a place upstairs. And my dad, in order to get us a place, told the landlord we only had two kids because that's all that was, uh, that they, that was advertised that would be permitted. So <laughs> my brother and I had a drill that when we knew the landlord was coming, we'd run down the back stairs and hide behind a parked car <laughs> until he left. And one time he, he appeared uh, un, unannounced, so we hid in a closet until he left. And, you know, one time there was probably some noise discovered and we were asked to leave. So, you know, again, we lived in 21 different places. That's crazy. By the time I was 17, including a couple cars. So does that inform my uh, politics? Yes. <laughs> Of course, because I know what a lot of people go through. One never knows the life journey that we take, what, it's, what it prepares us for. I mean, I'm, when I'm sleeping in a car with my family on the edge of the industrial valley, just you know, getting hope only from the flame of the basic oxygen furnace that's lighting up the night sky, was I thinking that, gee, this is going to help me become a congressman someday? <laughs> or governor of Ohio, I wasn't thinking anything like that. We're thinking about surviving. Right. You're thinking about, are there any more hamburgers, uh, you know, that uh, remain uneaten in the sack that uh, dad just brought from the White Castle? You know, you're just, you're riveted to survival. But what happens is that the experience that I've had has, has enabled me to develop a compassion for what people go through, to understand that life has its up and ups and downs, that no matter how comfortable you may be, life can take a turn and go sideways and all of a sudden everything you work for can suddenly be gone and you can't be so sure that it can't happen to you. So because of that understanding, uh, you know, I, I brought to public life and I bring to this moment an awareness of what people go through and, and a dedication to making sure that the institutions of government, you know, reflect people's real concerns. This is why, by the way, I'm such a fierce opponent of war. Huh. Because it's a racket. Because it just, it, it, gives, it gives these contractors billions of dollars. And what, and what happens with this? Political justifications are made for killing millions of innocent people all uh-huh. over the world. People who are just like us trying to survive. I've been all over the world. I've met people from all over the world. Yeah. There's not much of a difference between people from one country to another. The world's interconnected. It's interdependent. Yeah. And so when we start to... Um, uh, to say people, because of their race, color, creed, are so different, that's a lie. We're connected. The human genome, genome theory says we're 99% made of the same stuff. Right. So what's war about, really? What is it really about? It's a racket. It puts money in the pockets of people, and it uses, uses our young men and women as cannon fodder, and it, uh, and it destroys the lives of people everywhere. How do I know that? Look, I grew up in the inner city. I understand what, people, what people's basic needs are. They're not interested in killing other people. Mm -hmm. They're just trying to survive, and that's the same thing all over the world. Name a conversation that changed your life, that shifted, that you could have had it with a a loved one, a a parent, or whoever. Something that just maybe shifted the framework of how you looked at the world, influenced you. It could be good, it could be bad. Can you remember one, an example, that just shifted you? I can remember lots of them, but I'll I'll take you back to... uh the sixth grade at St. Aloysius yeah. uh, School and Church, uh, located at 110th and St. Clair Avenue in Cleveland. And uh, Sister Leona was the principal and also the, our sixth grade teacher. And uh, she, there's a lot of stories that I have connected with her, but one that really had an impact was that she Um, instructed the class, all of us, to pick up a book and read as she stepped out of the classroom for a few minutes 
when she came back, the room was in an uproar. And she was very displeased, to say the least. And just uh, the look on her face froze everybody in the room. Hmm. And, um, and then she said, children, I want you to take out a piece of paper and a pencil. I'm going to write something on the board, and I want you to copy it. So she wrote th this poem on the board. And then afterwards, she said, children, you're to go home tonight and copy this poem 50 times. And the groan from the class went up, and, uh, and people were writing their, um, the poem down. And, and this, um, this moment was indelibly inscribed on my, um, on my soul, because here was that poem, The Minute, I have only just one minute, only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. Give account if I abuse it. Heaven help me if I lose it. Just one tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Um, I was 12 years old hmm. when I wrote that down on a piece of paper. And Sister Leona remains with me every day. And that lesson, I took that lesson into so many moments in life that this moment matters. I hope you enjoyed the episode. A lot of people have been coming up to Aaron and I at parties, sending emails, and calling to tell us how much they love the podcast and ask when the next episode's coming out. A great way to stay connected is to visit the website, 7minutestoriespod.com. You can also subscribe on Apple Podcasts. And while you're there, let more people know what you think about Aaron and his storytelling by rating and leaving a review. Lastly, the biggest compliment you can give us is to share your favorite episode with friends on social media. Thanks again for listening.